the Shem's Loving Grace. Uh, we'll begin with a review of last week's lessons, the lessons one, two, and three on Torah 65. And Rabbi Nachman, in this particular discourse, what we call a Torah, Rabbi Nachman's Torahs, it's Rabbi Nachman's discourses, and look at Moran, he is sharing some inner secrets of passage from the book of Ruth, that uh, where Boaz takes Ruth under his patronage and invites her to glean this field. We'll unravel, we'll unravel all these secrets at, at, in our final lesson. Okay, so we'll, we'll be having another one or two lessons, and we'll be finished Torah uh, 65, but never know ahead of time because it's Rabbi Nachman's Torah is so deep, and it's like good uncovering layers and layers and layers. So trying to make it, at least so we get a basic understanding, we can't, uh, not so, uh, I don't have the preposition that we can understand the whole the whole Torah, but to make the, the basic understanding. Okay, in our first lesson, Rabbi Nachman described a field with rare plants and trees growing on it. Now, these plants and trees, they're metaphors for holy souls. They're really holy souls. But outside the field, there are many naked souls. The naked souls, and with the naked souls, what's the clothing of a soul? The clothing of a soul, the Zohar tells us, is that soul's good deeds. The mitzvot that a person does, the good deeds a person does, the fulfillment of the commandments of Torah. Every time you fill a man of Torah, you make it another garment for the soul. And just as there are uh, so many, the number of uh, parts of the body to co correspond with the number of mitzvot, and each mitzvot corresponds to part of the body, it's a spiritual garment. The light, in other words, in the next world, the soul wears lights. Okay, this is so, so a, a naked soul is a soul that's dark, that doesn't have lights. And in the next world, what looks at what a, what a person is fully dressed. Like you're going out to a formal attire and a and a gown or in a tuxedo. Those are all lights. These are all spiritual lights. You see, the person is is flooding and grounded, surrounded with these lights, embedded in lights. When a person is dark, that is just like nudity in the next world, and it's very very embarrassing. So the souls outside the field, they're trying to get back in the field, and they can't back get back in the field on their own. They need the help of the master gardener. Okay, so the master gardener knows what's best for each soul. And these souls are dependent on the master gardener. And what do they need? This is the rectification. Master gardener knows, just like the master gardener knows what each flower needs, what each tree needs. Uh, the, in other words, that what tree might need an amount of nitrogen fertilizer that would kill a certain flower. So the master gardener knows what to give each portion to each plant, what to give to each soul. Some soul needs a certain mitzvot, a certain portion of Torah to learn, has a certain soul correction. The master gardener knows with each one. Once again, we learn that there are five master gardeners, and these five master gardeners are the souls of Moses. Uh, this in Breast of Jewish talks about the five souls of Moses. The first was Moses, that Moses brought down the written Torah. The second was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wrote, wrote down the uh, esoteric Torah, which is the Zohar, the base of Kabbalah. And then after him was the Holy Arizal. The Holy Arizal uh, brought down the Torah of Kabbalah based on Rabbi Shimon. And then the, after that was the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov brought down the Torah of Hasidus, which is based on the Arizal. And then Rabbi Nachman, who says that his fire will burn until the coming of Shiach, Rabbi Nachman brings down the Torah of Emuna, that the Torah is based on his great-grandfather's teaching the Baal Shem Tov. Uh, just a little aside, this week we were up north and prayed for everyone, both by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's gravesite and by the Arizal and Sfat. Okay, so Bo Hashem, so everybody should be blessed. Okay, the master gardener has to be courageous. The master's gardener better a warrior, and the master gardener means a tzaddik. What does it mean he's got to be a warrior? He's got to fight a spiritual war, and he has to be undaunted because the forces working against the master guard are prodigious. And we see more Moses, Rabbi Shem Boyachai, the Arizal, Shentov, especially Rabbi Nachman, they all had tremendous opposition. And because they, they come to co correct the souls, and this is bring the souls to what's called the Tachlit, the soul's ultimate purpose. Rabbi Nachman talks in Torah 65 much about the soul's ultimate purpose. Uh, a person has to get to know his ultimate purpose, we explain how a person finds the ultimate purpose in our book, uh, The Path to Your Peak, because a person cannot reach uh, his peak in life if he doesn't fulfill his, his or her mission. 
And how do they do? They, they establish this. If you have the chance, take a, take a look at the path to your peak. Okay, so the Master Gardener has to be courageous and is an exceptionally prodigious spiritual level. And he's the leader of the generation, and his life is far from easy. It's In other words, it's not like uh, the flesh and blood politicians. They're looking for money. They're looking for power. They're looking for personal amenities. Uh, the Gemara says that a spiritual leader, especially a spiritual leader of, gener of generation, is like in a ball and chain. He's a, a slave to generation. He's just a subservient to the generation. He knows he's not living for himself. He's living for the whole generation, living for every soul in that generation. So it's a tremendous responsibility to take on this. Moses knew he had a tremendous responsibility. And the souls after him that will go in Moses' footsteps. Okay, so the, the master gardener is not intimidated by suffering. And certainly not by hardship. And despite the suffering, died the heart, this, with the, the metaphor, the strong winds and the tormenting rains, he still takes care of the garden and every single plant in that garden. Now, when the masters, when the master gardener succeeds in rectifying the souls and bringing them in the garden, bring them in the garden, that's bringing them under Shem's wing. This is the garden, the garden, the, in the uh, shade of the, the tree of life. The tree of life, that's a metaphor for Shem. All life comes from Shem. Okay, so when he brings it in, then they're they're gratified. They're gratified. And how does a soul know that it's inside the garden when it has this desire to pray? When a soul doesn't have a desire to pray or doesn't have a desire to learn, well, it could pretty be rest assured that that soul is outside the garden because inside the garden feels the the soul feels the beauty of a shem. Soul wants to get closer and closer and closer, and it's intoxicating. It's not enough. This is like a, 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 a positive. Every Everything in the world has a positive side and negative side. Uh, it's when a person could be, there's an expression, intoxicated with love. When a person is intoxicated with love of Shem, just like a person who is an, an alcoholic, has to have alcohol all the time. When a person is intoxicated with the Shem, has to have love of Shem, has to be close to Shem. Nothing is ever more. Given, <laughs> you have uh, uh, 50 proof of Muna, that's not enough. You want 60 proof of Muna, then 70 proof of Muna, then 100 proof of Muna. <laughs> the pure, pure alcohol of Muna, pure of Muna. There's, there's more and more and more. So when the soul wants to get close to Shem, and the soul feels a yearning to get close to Shem, then that is the influence of the master gardener that's bringing the soul, even the soul may not be aware of it, because the master gardener, Rabbi Nachman, he says he can, he can be much more active when he's not limited by the body than outside. When Rabbi Nachman was, bought, was dying, his daughter, Sarki, she said to him, she said, Abba, how am I going to live without you? He was a young man, and his daughter... Uh, Sarki, Sarki is a nickname for Sarah, Ukrainian Yiddish. And Sarki said, Tati, I, my father, I'm, I'm going to live without you. Rabbi Nachman said, he said, when I go into the next world, okay, it's like speaking to me from one room to another, that I'm in the bedroom and you're in the kitchen. Okay, I'm still here. I still hear you. You'll still, you'll still hear me. Speak to me. <laughs> this is what Rabbi Nachman himself told his daughter. So we know that the Moses of the generation is with us. He's with us. The tzaddik is that's the, the Gemara tells us tzaddik never dies. That tzaddik, the spirit of the tzaddik, is always alive. We're not talking about the body. Okay. Certainly, the body uh, is, is long gone from this world. But the spirit of the tzaddik is with with us. Okay, that was our first lesson. Our second lesson: we learned that when the souls do the will of Hashem, then they bear fruit. Ah, this is another success. The master gardener. Because he brings it, you know, a successful, a successful gardener. Your your vegetables, your vegetable plants yield beautiful little tomatoes, and or your your peach tree has beautiful peaches. Okay, and some people they they have fruit trees, they have vegetables, and they don't see any vegetables. There's no there's no crop. So what happens when the souls bear fruit? The master gardener's eyes shine. Now, what happens when the master gardener's eyes shine? It means it's compared. To Rabbi Nachman compares it to an expression of Doa Sedet Sofim. It's like a, a vantage place up on a mountain where you can see an entire field far, far, far away. If a person's down on the ground, you can't see 10 miles away. But if we're standing on the mountain, you can see the entire field, even the field is, is 50 miles long. And 
could see it's called the state sophim. And sophim means a vantage point, which means that the, the master gardener can see into that soul, both chronologically and both geographically, that the master gardener can see all the corrections that soul has done ever since Adam and Eve, that's when it's first go around, until its final correction. And the master gardener, Rabbi Nachman teaches us, could take the soul to its ultimate correction. So, for example, I'll give you a little mundane example. Um, and there's something in child education. If your child expresses a desire to play the violin, okay, but daddy was a frustrated footballer, okay? He wanted to play for Manchester United and has succeeded. He wanted to play for the New York Jets and never succeeded. No, I don't want you playing a violin, he says to his son. I want you to be a footballer. Okay, well, he's murdering his son because his son won't be a good footballer, nor will he play the violin. He'll be frustrated. Not so the master gardener. The master gardener sees that the soul has an aptitude, a correction for playing music. Well, maybe that soul is a Levite. Maybe that soul is destined to sing, to play music in, in the holy temple. Well, the master gardener knows how to channel the soul into its soul correction. Sometimes we uh, see things no, happen to us. Uh, see, David, make sure everybody's muted, please. Okay. Uh, sometimes things happen to us and we see that... Uh, with, without our involvement, we're led into a certain path, and that path is also very successful. And we see, I know in my own life, my own path, things that I planned on doing, things that I thought I was destined to do, didn't work out at all. And things that were totally surprising and didn't even dream of doing, which channeled it this path and then saw that it, it was the, the fruit of, of these labors, but it's not my initiative. So, Anything I, I see in my own life that anything that I ever planned doesn't work. Anything that a Shem plan, it does work. Well, how does this plan filter down? This plan filters down by way of the master gardener. That the master gardener is a Shem's emissary to pull strings to get us to our own soul correction. So therefore, it's important to have a connection with the master gardener. Now, if a person denies they don't, they don't believe in that. They, they know Rabbi Nachman had a lot of opposition. Uh, they don't believe that they don't accept this. Okay, then accept it. Then uh, good luck in finding your soul correction. Okay, so when the soul does Hashem's will, the master gardener's eyes, they shine. Okay, but when the souls fail to do Hashem's will, the master gardener's eyes dim. And that's what's called in Lamentations De Bochim, a field of crying, especially during the three weeks. So, the master gardeners, if his the souls that he is entitled to his care, just like the flowers and the plant, when the flower withers or a plant dries out or a tree is infested with 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 uh, insects or predators or whatever, whatever with the disease, then the master gardener's eyes they dim, and he loses his far away eyesight. Okay, so that's important. We have we have behooved us. We have to support. The master will do Hashem's will, and it gives the master gardener power to help us even further in our soul correction. Now, this is also, we said that the master gardener's eyes dim, also explains why Mashiach hasn't been here. The Gemara says something, right? The Gemara says that in every generation, there is a soul of Mashiach. You know, there are many, I don't, I don't, don't ever make fun of the Chabad Hasidim, that they say Lubavitcher Rebbe was Mashiach. He very well could have been Mashiach. I mean, he did so much good in the world, brought so many people close to Hashem. But, says the Gemara, when the generation does not merit, then the soul that could have been Mashiach, it passes on, and Hashem does not be revealed. Okay, generation, you're not worried, you're not worthy of Mashiach, you don't get it. So we see every generation does have a master gardener that could be Mashiach, but if the generation is not worth it, then uh, we see that the master gardener's eyes, they get dim, and he's out. So now at this point in our second lesson, Rabbi Nachman teaches us the beauty of prayer. Rabbi Nachman teaches that prayer is like, again, he uses the same imagery of walking in a garden, that every letter of prayer and every word of prayer is like walking in this exquisitely beautiful garden and in wildflowers, it's got wildflowers, and you pick up one wildflower, a purple wildflower, then a red wildflower and a blue one and a green one. And you have this beautiful bouquet. Every word of prayer you say, not only every word, every syllable, every word, the words come together to make a sense, the sense come together to make a paragraph and the whole prayer. 
And every single word of prayer, it's connected to the soul because prayer with intent, with kavona, it comes from the soul. And at word of prayer, it says, soul, don't leave me. Don't leave me. So the soul wants to cling to the word of prayer, but the word of prayer wants to cling to the soul just as much. But it can't stay, stay prayer in one word. Like take the example of Amida, the Shemunai says, a lot of words, it's 18 blessings, have to keep on going. But when we pray truly, we could be in the last letter of the last word, and we're still in the first letter of the first word. And this is perfect prayer, explains Rabbi Nachman, when a person is connected with every letter, every word. And what this does, it's like bringing a prayer offering, a beautiful Aramaic, uh, aromatic, aromatic, a beautiful aromatic bouquet to the Almighty. And no angel can stop this. This is a gift for the Almighty. And that's why these prayers with intent, they go straight up. So Rabbi Nachman explains the power of these prayers, but every utterance, every letter, every word, it's priceless. It's priceless. It's not just a bunch of separate letters. That was ver that was lesson two. We're going to lesson three. And lesson three, we learn one of Rabbi Nachman's cardinal teachings that all of a person's tribulations and all of a person's sufferings that gives people think that Hashem hates them. It's the exact opposite. If a person has suffering, Hashem loves them because Hashem is bringing them personally to their soul correction. Now, the tribulations that they don't come from the messenger, they come from Hashem. Hashem does everything. The master gardener is all these, uh, he's a messenger from Hashem. Okay, he's like a like a like a mailman, but he's carrying a message from Hashem. He's a very good mailman, he's carrying a message from Hashem. Tribulations and suffering are messages from Hashem. And just imagine that a person has everything perfect in life. Perfect income, perfect health, perfect marriage, perfect children, perfect place of employment, perfect business. Person's going to become very arrogant. And as he becomes arrogant, he or she thinks that they're self-sufficient. They don't need Hashem. When Hashem puts us in a situation where we need him, this is love. This means that Hashem wants to bring us close to him. Hashem wants us to be closer to him than we are. This is spiritual growth, getting close to Hashem. And this is our ultimate purpose on earth to getting closer and closer and closer to Hashem. This is what the Torah tells us. Shuvu ad Hashem, that we should make penitence we should return penitence is right the right word it's return we should return until we reach hashem so until we reach the shem we haven't finished doing the mitzvah of tshuva coming back to him so whenever a person focuses on that ultimate purpose getting close to shem now we use the example and last week in lesson three of a champion athlete or an elite soldier how much suffering they go through but ask them, okay, you don't have to go through suffering, but you can't be in the unit. Oh, no, they don't want to. They want to the athlete wants to be a champion. The soldier, he wants to be in this elite unit. They're willing to undergo all the suffering. Why? Because they have the spiritual awareness where they realize that the suffering is for their own good. The suffering creates them growth, whether you know, mental growth, physical growth, physical growth in the case of an athlete, emotional growth. It's all for the best. And here, our suffering creates for us spiritual growth where it creates the climate for us to get closer to Hashem. This is a gift from Hashem. Therefore, says Rabbi Nachman, since it's a gift from Hashem, when we look at the ultimate purpose of the suffering, that it comes from Hashem, and it's for a good, that means intrinsically everything is good. And this one of Rabbi Nachman's favorite sayings that a lot of people can understand, there is no bad in the world. Ein rabba olam klal. There's no bad in the world at all, because everything that even the seemingly bad, it's all for our very best. Now, what happens when a person's suffering and a person takes the focus off the physical suffering, off the emotional suffering, and focuses on Hashem, the tachlitz, the ultimate purpose, need to get close to Hashem, then what happens is the person focuses on the next world, focus on the spiritual, the spiritual pan of his or her life, focus on Hashem, and this nullifies this world this is what Rabbi Nachman says a person should close his eyes because a person intrinsically that closes his eyes strong when he or she is suffering. What are they doing? The soul is saying, don't look at this world. Look at the next world. So the soul is closing its eyes. We close its eyes. It doesn't want to see this world. And something like it squints because it's trying to see very hard, looking for Shem, looking for Shem. Now, what happens when the soul does that? The suffering is relieved. And when the suffering is relieved, a person within the midst of the hurricane, within the midst of the tri tribulations, a person could be happy. 
And this is what we do when a when, when person feels pain, when a person suffers, focus on Hashem, focus on the ultimate purpose, because everything is intrinsically good and everything is for an ultimate purpose. Now, the purpose is getting close to Hashem. Okay, so that was last week's lesson. In a nutshell, we now continue on to this week's lesson, part four of Torah 65. Okay, Rabbi Nachman says, Vihine. Rabbi Nachman says, and the hour of Beetle. Beetle is a word in Hebrew, it's a spiritual word. Uh, the closest thing to it is self nullification. When a person nullifies itself, Beetle means really canceling. You can say, okay, cancel a check. You mevatel the, the, the check. Or when a person cancels an, an, an appointment, he's mevatel the appointment. When a person cancels himself, this is called Beetle. What does it mean, Beetle, spiritually, that a person has canceled his presence in this world and focuses on the next world? That's self nullification. This is a degree of high concentration that the big tzaddikim, they reach in Eid Bududut. They reach when they're doing his personal prayer and they focus on Hashem so hard that, that they can't even feel this world. There is uh, Rabbi Aaron Arnovich was a famous tzaddik in Jerusalem. And it was in 1948, the Independence War, and it was Davening Mincha and Mea Sharim. There, the, then the Jordan border was, was one street away from Mea Sharim. That, that's where today's, uh, today's number one, the, the road number one in, in Jerusalem that splits West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. That used to be the Jordanian border. Well, Rabban Arnovich, while he was Davening, a Jordanian mortar shell fell through the roof of the synagogue and maimed about 10 or 15 people in the synagogue. He was in a corner and he was so deep in Mincha, he did not feel the bomb flying. He was, he was out of this world. This is the, the power of the big Sadiqim. They they feel nothing. Okay. That so when a person attains, we're talking an extreme level of great Sadiqim. When a person attains a level like that, he can really nullify all pain. And this is why the, the stories of of, of Siddiquim that went through operations without uh, without anesthesia. It's odd that they, they say uh, uh, they would think of throughout the operation, they'd think of a, a Gomorrah or, a, tra or a particular passage in the Zohar and concentrate them very hard. They wouldn't be in the world. They wouldn't feel the pain. Uh, this is a, a tremendous level. This is a, an extreme level. So each of us on our own spiritual level, we can attain a level of Betul, when we're focused on Hashem, focused on the next world, where you, you're doing Hippo, dude, you're out in the field, you're speaking to Hashem, and you feel love of Hashem, and you're not thinking about the electric bill anymore, you're not thinking about the abusive boss at, at, at work or about the nasty neighbor, you're not thinking about any of the difficulties in life, you're not thinking about the war, you're not thinking about anything, thinking only about Hashem, and you don't feel the pain. But there's a problem, says Rabbi Nachman, and to keep it real, Okay, when person temporarily doesn't feel the pain and torment because the person has succeeded in nullifying himself. Rabbi Nachman says there's a problem. The heart expands and contracts. The lungs expand and contract. A person can't be in a spiritual high all the time. This says a beetle, self-nullification, if a person like that all the time, won't eat, won't drink, won't caught that in this world, person will leave this world. You can't be that way all the time. So sometimes even the plane, the plane has to come back on and land and refuel and, and have maintenance. So the soul can't stay like that. None of our souls. Maybe it depends on the strength of the soul. One soul could do it longer. One soul could do it for an hour, two hours, three hours. But soul has to come back. There's a problem when the soul comes back. When the soul comes back to the earth, then... The dark side wakes up. Ah, oh, you think you're playing games on me? You want to leave me? And you want to run away to a sham? Now I'm back, says the dark side. And the pain is back. And the pain is even stronger. You say, wait a second. Then what did I do? Okay, for a, a little bit of short-term relief, now I'm coming back and the pain is even stronger. Many people complain about this. Many people complain about this. I hear this from from new Noahides, I hear this from uh, new Balei Chuvas, and it's from people that are making a conscious effort to get stronger. And they say, Rabbi, I've been doing everything and talking to Shem and doing Yippo do, and now things are even worse. What's going on? And you think, but Shem doesn't want my service. Shem doesn't want my effort. No, no. It means that you've done the right thing. 
done the right thing. But what you've done is you've elevated yourself up to a higher spiritual level, and now you're in a higher league before you're playing in a low league compared to American baseball. You have C League, B League, A League, Double A League, Triple A League, then the major leagues. Every time you get stronger, you go up to a different league. And every league, there is difficult, more, more, di more difficult competition. Same thing with the boxer. There's a, a lot of lightweight boxers and uh, amateur boxers and Olympic boxing and then professional boxing, professional boxing, where the, the champion, the world champion is going to get uh, $5 million. The loser get a million and a half dollars. Uh, it, it's big stakes. Big stakes, and they don't. A person gets get hit hard there, champion. It's even even for the champion who wins the championship, he still comes away with a, a black eye and a bloody nose. It's difficult, and this happens to the soul. The soul goes on this high level, and the soul comes back to this world, and now the dark side gets even stronger. But the soul is not the same because when the soul was in the state of self nullification, the state of beetle. Let's call it self-nullification. The state of Beetle with the soul nullified itself and only focused on Hashem, only focused on the next world. But then even though the soul came back, the soul made contact with divine light. The divine light left an impression on that soul. There's an imprint on the soul. So the soul comes back with this divine imprint and with this divine imprint now left on the soul, it's like a... Uh, the muscle feels a person had a very difficult a resistance workout, and then the muscle is sore, muscle fibers are torn. But the imprint on that, now the muscle is going to grow back much stronger. The same with the soul. The soul, once it has the divine imprint, a certain level of light, the soul has gone up for maybe a 100-watt soul to a 120 watt soul the whole soul is not stronger it's capable of more illumination and receiving more illumination and every time the soul does this it gets a little bit stronger okay but the dark side to keep the person's choice the dark side has to get stronger now if the dark side doesn't get stronger then the soul is not going to seek the soul's going to think oh, it's fine oh i'm fine i'm great i'm already isaiah the prophet or maybe joshua or moses no shem doesn't want that so Hashem all the time makes our challenges a little more difficult, a little more difficult, a little more difficult. And don't worry about falling down because King Solomon said that Shevan uh, Afal Tzadikva come, that righteous people, they fall down seven times, but they get right back up. Now Rabbi Abba continues. So so once the soul comes back from its little uh, tour of self nullification the soul has been privy to this divine light, that this is an aspect of the world to come, of the ultimate purpose. And the soul has a feeling that everything is one. So even though the soul is going to be challenged more, the soul has a stronger feeling of Amunah, a stronger feeling of the oneness of Hashem. <clears throat> and this is such an incentive for the soul to go even higher and higher. So this is what happens. This is the benefit of when a soul goes up and then the soul comes back. Now, even though the opposition could welcome back, it doesn't feel, it doesn't, doesn't, it feels renewed pain. Okay, but the renewed pain, the soul is much better equipped now to handle the renewed pain. Now, why does the soul feel the renewed pain? You have to understand Rabbi Nachman's knowledge. We're talking about Rabbi Nachman knew about the nervous system before the professors in the medical schools knew about it. Rabbi Nachman knew the secrets of creation. Rabbi Nachman knew the secrets from Torah. Look what Rabbi Nachman says here. This is amazing. Okay, when he says, why does the soul feel the renewed sorrow of the tribulations. Because all pain stems from the brain. A person thinks he got hit on the hand. No, it's not the hand. The person stems from the brain. Why from the brain? Because from the brain goes channels to all the body. Rabbi Nachman is talking about the nerve channels. Rabbi Nachman was talking about the nervous system. Rabbi Nachman had a complete understanding of the nervous system and how it functioned. It's right here in part four of Torah 65. And that's why anywhere in the body we have pain that the brain is going to feel it. So what's happened in the brain? Now Rabbi Nachman will tell us. 
Again, once again, Rabbi uses the, 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 the word da. This is the ultimate knowledge. We said da, da, dalid ayin, okay, and reversed ayin dalid. It's, it's forever. This is the knowledge for prosperity. This is knowledge from the beginning of the world to the end of the world. Achakach, shechozer me'abitul elakelim. When a person comes back from self nullification inside his only bodily equipment, in other words, his brain, and now the tribulations, they tr get stronger. It's like in a wrestling match where a person does one move and does something stronger where the opponent now has to be stronger to resist that and it gets stronger and it gets stronger until one gives out. Okay, so when when a person sees that the other one's getting stronger, then he strikes himself. And he strikes himself in more. This is what Hashem wants. Hashem sees that the tribulations are getting stronger against us because Hashem wants us to make a strike. Knows we have the Hashem is not going to give us uh, tribulations that break us. If Hashem gives us suffering, gives us tribulation, it means that Hashem gave us the strength and the wherewithal to handle them. Because otherwise, it's Hashem's taking away a free choice. So to maintain a free choice, Hashem takes us to the hilt. And we have to use all our potential to resist the, the, the other side, to cling to Hashem, to cling to our muna. Okay. Same thing. When the dark side sees that we're clinging to Hashem, dark side is going to get stronger. Therefore, when a person comes back from self nullification, you can see that uh, the suffering appears to be better because the suffering is trying to keep us from a higher spiritual level. And that's why the person, the, 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 way, the way to escape the suffering. It's not to the right, not to the left, up. Just go further up. Go back up to the Shem. Okay. So now Rabbi Nachman continues and continues. It's amazing. It's a spiritual game plan so we can understand. So afterward, So how ultimately do we relieve ourselves from the Yisurim, from the from tribulations? Rabbi Nachman says that since a person has gone to this higher spiritual level and has been privy to more divine light, not privy to more divine light, goes up to higher spiritual level. Now he's a higher spiritual level. He understands things in Torah that he never understood up till now. And this gives that person the power to write nuances in Torah. And so every person, every person should keep a notebook and every person on his or her own level uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a Jew, whether it's a Noahide. Uh, for example, I did this uh, one very uh, wonderful Noahide young woman, Veronica Port. She wrote uh, her her impressions about Noahide. She wrote a beautiful, a beautiful book about for, for Noahides. Okay, and that's just it's beautiful. I wrote that book. I I gave that book uh, an approbation. It's a, it's a beautiful book. Everyone should do that. If certainly a, a Jew should write what you can, your nuances in Torah, if you're Noahide, your nuances in the, the Noahide mitzvot. And in the mitzvot, you could write about uh, uh, what, you, what you learn, your insights in honoring parents, your insights in uh, man and fellow man, insights, not, sure, in all, in all ethics, we should do it. So what happens is when the soul occupies itself in the Torah, and anything you have to understand, people sometimes people question me that the high brows on 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 our side. Do, well, what are you teaching all this Torah to the Noahides? Uh, it's not Rebbe Meir Balanes. Also, it was in Tiberias. I was at his grave site. This one was up north. Sorry, to, to a great prank for everybody there. Rebbe Meir Balanes says in Gemara Tractate Avoid the Zora that when a Noahide is occupied in his or her portion of Torah. That Noahide is on the level of a high priest in the holy temple. You hear that? That's words of Rabbi Meir Balanes. Rabbi Meir Balanes, that's a sign check. And this is where at the power form. So certainly keep a notebook. And as you go higher, write down your nuances in Torah, because this is this, this is something Hashem has tremendous gratification. And maybe not even for uh, for, for yourself. And maybe one day you'll, you'll turn into a published book. Okay, everybody does that. And Hashem loves this. So you have to know when Shabbat is over, the Zohar tells us that when Shabbat is over, Shabbat is a day where 
we should take and involve ourselves in spirituality and, and in Torah and not just watch football. <laughs> no, heaven forbid, the person be occupied in spirituality. And when the extra soul, the Neshama Yitayla, goes back upstairs after Shabbat, and they ask, actually, what did you, what was your nuance? What, what, did, what, what did you learn new? What did you, uh, you and something new? You could, that when the soul has something to say, oh, yes, I learned this. I have understood this nuance. Then Hashem and all the heavenly court, they come and listen to this, and it gives great gratification. So this is, Rabbi Nachman tells us, by uh, enhanced insight into the Torah, this relieves the suffering. And this, what person gets this, this is another benefit of the Rishimu. The Rishimu was the impression, the imprint that the person got from divine light when he was in a state of Betul. Some people call this uh, self-transcendence. I don't like that's a kind of a hippie word. It's a self-nullification. We nullify your presence in this world and connect to Hashem. So when a person returns from that state of self-nullification, then the sign that he was successful, or she was successful, that they have new insights in Torah. Okay, the new insights in Torah, and that's one of the benefits of going up there. Rebbe Nachman continues. He says, a simple kli chidushim doraita, that one of the greatest joys of a person, and this is Hashem, also the greater gratification we give to Hashem, is when we make nuances in Torah. Kamo shemu abotenu zichoda, that our, our sages said, in tractate Shabbat, page 98, that when at the time of Matan Torah and the soul said, uh, we shall do and we shall hear, first we're going to do, and then we'll hear the logic. We're not going to say, we we'll ask for reason first. First we do like good soldiers, and afterward we'll hear about it. Then Hashem rewarded each soul with a double crown. One crown for we shall do, and one crown for we shall hear. And after the golden calf, these, these crowns were taken away. The Rabbi Nachman says in the future, they're going to come back to us. And that's the, the joy, one of the joys that's going to be in the future when Mashiach comes. So Rabbi Nachman continues to talk about the value of renewing, renewal Torah, the value of nuances of Torah. Rabbi Nachman says, what does the, this joy of making a nuance in Torah, all of a sudden, wow, man, you realize, you realize that, wait a second, it's a fake. It's if you do the, the numerical value, numerical value, the gematia, it's 240 Amalek, 240. Wow, that every doubt, Safek is doubt, every doubt I have in the moon comes from Amalek. And this is a new one, the Torah. Oh, wow. Okay, the 240 is Amalek, 240 is doubt. Doubt in the moon comes from Amalek. This is the, the type of thing that makes the soul so happy. So what happens when this happiness that the soul has, when the soul makes a nuance in Torah, then it's the tribulations and the suffering is completely forgotten. Because the Torah gives such joy to a soul, it's it completely forgotten. I remember one time in uh, in the army when I, when I broke my ribs. I broke my ribs. I also got hit on the head and I, I had a big scar in the head and, and, and bleeding. It's that. It's tremendous. The, 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 the pain in the ribs was was so much that I didn't feel it. And any other injury. They got an injury and trapped in the leg. But what you have pain. It was, and this is the measure of good it's 500 times stronger than the measure of bad. We have the measure of good, of nuances in Torah. And they can understand why people love learning Torah so much. You get a, a, a nuance in Torah. Forget about everything, man. The world, all the pain in the world. It's, a, it's really ridiculous why a person would spend time surfing on the web and hearing garbage and, and news from people who don't believe in Hashem and all this negativity and the negative thing. You could be learning Torah. We're spending your time learning Torah. What are you doing all this inconsequential thing for? And just, we pray for this. Pray for us to use our time. Because what happens, and uh, all, all, all the news, it just makes the soul suffer. It's just more suffering, more depression, more sadness. Things are bad. But no, but the third thing is good. It's a, you're, you're in, you're involved in with divine light. So by renewing Torah, this is like a fire extinguisher that, Shuts off it, it, it completely extinguishes the suffering. So, the 
what does Rabbi Nachman say? The Rabbi Nachman says that the pain of uh, tribulations at Sima on a nefesh. This is the thirsty soul. Let's name place as the thirsty soul. This is the pain. Why is a soul thirsty? The soul is thirsty because of all of its suffering. And the soul needs something. The soul needs something with the soul. But the Torah, throughout the Gomorrah, throughout the Zohar, if a person is thirsty, let him go to water. And the water is the Torah. The Gomorrah tells us, Ain, Ain, Mayim, El, Toya, there's no water, but the but Torah. Every time they're talking about water, it's all a metaphor for Torah because this quenches the thirst of the soul. This is the light of Hashem. We go to the light of the Shem, the same thing with Hippo the Dude. When a person connects, really connects in deep personal prayer and it's divine light, this is this quenches the thirst of the soul. What do people do? They look for cheap thrills. There's no cheap thrills, not the ball game, not the discotheque, not Disneyland. Nothing satisfies the soul. And this is what King Solomon, the wise of all men, never walked the earth. He says, the soul can't be satiated. The only thing that can quench a soul's thirst is divine light. Divine light we get from prayer and we get from Torah and we get from performing uh, Hashem's mitzvot. That's divine light. So through this enhanced insight in Torah that a person merits from the state of Beetle, from the state of self nullification, person comes back with a thirst of a soul, and the thirst of a soul is then quenched because the person, because of the person's impression being close to Shem, now has nuances in Torah, and the nuances in Torah, Hashem gives the person the the bottle of water to quench the thirst, and that's the nuance that comes from it comes from uh, uh, it comes from Hashem. So Rabbi Nachman says, just like salt makes a person thirsty salt is the aspect of suffering salt like pouring so we say pour salt on your wounds that makes it be stronger so the salt you also put on a, on a ritual sacrifice it pulls the blood out of the ritual sacrifice and the, the blood is just all, all then offered to a shem but the salt is thirst and we nullify the salt the pain of this the pain by the water that washes away the salt. That's the water, the water of Torah, the water of prayer, water of personal prayer. Why does it do that? Rabbi Nachman explains, And the soul is the daughter of the intellect, the intellect that's in the brain. Because one soul is raised, it's just like a mother raises a child, the soul is raised by a person's intellect. That person's intellect either nurtures the soul, or if it's an abusive parent, it destroys the soul. Okay, so we say that that, that in Proverbs, uh, King Solomon, chapter 19 of Proverbs, says that the soul, it's not good without spiritual awareness. Because this is now when the soul gets nutrition from the intellect, then the soul bears fruit. But when the intellect is blemished, then it's like, what King Solomon, uh, King David says in Psalm 107, that the fruitful land becomes a salty waste. The Psalm 107, verse 34. So it depends. We have to feed our soul, what nourishes the soul, what satisfies the soul, and keep toxins away from the soul. Only put good things into the soul. And this is what Isaiah said again, 55, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1, let all thirsty souls come to the water. Rashi says right there, well, the water, that's talking about the Torah. I say it's calling us to the Torah. And this is Rabbi Nachman, that Now we understand what King David says in Psalm 94, happy is the person that Hashem chastises, but then instructs in his Torah. Person chastises, that's the suffering, and then instructs his Torah, Hashem gives them uh, nuances in Torah. Because of the suffering, the person runs up to Hashem, good does prays profusely, uh, does he put a dude, especially personal, private, secluded prayer, and gets to a state where the soul nullifies itself, gets this divine light from the beetle, from the self nullification, and comes back with this imprint. The imprint of divine light opens the soul ability to get nuances the soul gets nuances and the soul gets a nuance the soul is now happy and then really the tribulations are over it doesn't feel the soul of tribulations okay that is the end of part four next week we continue with part five 
And like I said, I'm not looking at the watch, whether it takes us another week or another two weeks, but this way we're going to learn this and we'll review Nick, before we learn part five next week, we'll learn the first four parts, review them all again, because it's such an important Torah and we didn't deem the hearts. This is the Torah we learn. Uh, the, the best, the most valued Torah is not just an academic exercise. It's the Torah that we learn to live by. So Hashem should help us internalize the teachings of Rabbi Nachman, live by them, and always have a smile on our face. Amen.